I heard something last night on the internet. I was listening to Doug Batchelor, and when he said what he said, it hit me, you know, this is the way they're going to do it. He got flagged for a hate sermon. He was preaching about the Pope being the Antichrist, the beast, and they flagged him. They're going to flag all of us. That's what's going to happen. It's coming. So you better not be alone when it does. reading. Very encouraging verse this morning from Revelation 21 verses 3 through 5. 21, 3 to 5. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and he shall be with them, and be their God. <clears throat> and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no sorrow, no crying. There shall be no pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Amen.
when I got home from Thanksgiving, which has now been over a month ago, um, took a ride up. We own some property up on Kegel Mountain in Dunlap. And I was going there because Seth had helped me put some water containers up on the property and I wanted to winterize them so the little spigots didn't break. When I got there, I was taken aback as I saw there was fence on my property that hadn't been there before. And I, my mouth just dropped open. I was like, wow. I kind of had an idea of maybe some people who were responsible. And, and yes, it was a wonderful gift, but I was told it actually was a gift from the Jasper Church. And so I want to say thank you to my Jasper Church family. I know all of you weren't able to go up and put the fence up, but I know many of you contributed to help uh, get the fence put up. So thank you for being a generous church. Amen. Thank you for being a kind church. And uh, as I was thinking today, why, why do I like this district so much? I was thinking of one of my favorite scripture songs that Seth taught at VBS, Be Ye Kind One to Another. I thought, there's a lot of kind people Amen. in this district. There's just a lot of kind people in our church, and thank you for being kind. Amen. And it says tender-hearted, but it ties something to tender-heartedness, because when you're tender-hearted, you're going to forgive one another. And I said, this is a very forgiving district. Yeah, there are times where there are disagreements or where people do things that hurt other people, but I've seen a lot of reconciliation take place. I said, it's such a blessing to be part of a church that is kind, Amen. that is tender-hearted, that forgives one another, even as God in Christ Jesus has forgiven us. Thank you uh, for allowing me to be blessed to be part of your family. I don't know if you've ever received a letter like this from the post office. Have you ever received a letter like this? It says, we care. <laughs> we care, dear valued customer. I want to extend my sincere apology as your postmaster that the enclosed document was inadvertently damaged in our handling of the postal service, which in this case inadvertently opened. I don't know if it was inadvertent or not. Uh, but I opened, I said, you know, this is a letter that uh, went to the post office and now they repackaged it in a post office letter and it was nicely opened by, now I don't open my letters nicely at all, so someone there had a nice little letter opener, some type of knife, and they opened this letter. And I wondered what I received that someone at the post office felt that they needed to look at. I was told today at Whitwell that the post office has the right to open any letter they want to open. So just know that. When you, when you send a Christmas card or a birthday card, they have the right to open that if they want to. Now this card, I don't know why the conference did that, but it says big letters, free prize. So it says free prize right there, and then you know on the front it says Georgia Cumberland Conference. So they're probably saying, this, wow, there's a free prize in there. Is this some kind of vacation voucher? Is it some kind of gift card? And it's coming to me at Christmas time. So, of course, I'd be tempted to want to open it, too. I mean, I have the right to. So when I got the letter, I said, well, there's still something in there. So I want to know what they uh, were trying to get. I figured it probably wasn't a vacation voucher or gift cards because uh, that hasn't happened. So anyways, <laughs> I opened it up, and there was a free gift. There was a free prize inside. It says, if you will preach sermons on giving for the next six weeks, we will give you a free gift card to the ABC. And I kind of smiled because I was thinking, I wonder what that postman thought when he saw that. If you preach a sermon on giving and tithing for the next <laughs> six weeks, you can get a free gift card to the Adventist Book Center. <laughs> now, I'm not going to be preaching on tithing and giving the next six weeks. I believe that if you're surrendered to Jesus, you're naturally going to do that out of what the Holy Spirit puts in your heart. But I thought about this letter a lot and said, you know what? Someone wanted to get my free prize. <laughs> Apparently they didn't want it that badly because they put the free prize back in here. Uh, but I said, somebody wanted it and they were trying to steal my prize. Yeah. And I guess they have a right to do it, according to what I heard in Whitwell today. They have the right to open up letters that say free prizes and take what they want. I said, we have a greater enemy today that wants to steal our right. heavenly prize. Right. But he doesn't have the right to do that. Now, you can give up your birthright. You can say, okay, devil, I'll, I'll give up this prize. But eternity is yours for the taking, and no one can steal it from you. Amen. You can give it up. So I would hope, we're so close to the end. 
We are so close to receiving our eternal prize. I would hope that you would guard it with your life. Because that free prize is eternal life. To live with the redeemed, to live with your Savior forever. Don't give up your free prize in 2021. Before we get into the word today, let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, today I thank you so much for the gift, the free gift of eternal life we have through Jesus Christ our Lord. We thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit, which you want us to take freely every day to transform us to be more like Jesus. We thank you for the gift of the Bible, and we ask today that your Holy Spirit will teach us and guide us into all truth, especially present truth that you have for us today. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you uh, saw the sermon title, you kind of already have an idea of what uh, the message is going to be on today. It's entitled, The Great Reset. Now, if you've ever, uh, I guess, been on any media sites in the last couple months or walked through the store, you've probably seen something on the internet or something on the news or something in a magazine that has frontlined this topic, the Great Reset. The amazing thing, there's still a lot of people, even in the church, that don't even know what the Great Reset is. And so today I want to take a little bit of time because the Great Reset is planned and coming in 2021. And since this is right at the door, I think it would be wise. I mean, shouldn't God's people know what's happening? I mean, if the world knows what's happening, a lot of them don't know either because they're just interested in uh, the entertainments of the world. They're blind to it. But God's people shouldn't be blind. We shouldn't be caught off guard or unaware of what is coming in 2021. No, 2020 was setting things up for 2021, and the world changed a lot in 2020, and it's going to change a lot more in 2021. And uh, so some might be saying, well, what is this Great Reset? Well, the commercial that they were advertising on the Internet, which has now been taken down because a lot of people started uh, putting it out and everyone started talking about it and they didn't like it, but it started out saying this, imagine a world where you own nothing and you are happy. And they have a young guy, probably in his early 20s, and he's sitting on his front porch outside this nice apartment building, and he's smiling and says, imagine living in a world where you own nothing and you are happy. And he's smiling. It's a world where everything is rented, or leased. You own none of it. Everything is controlled by a higher power, and you are just part of a social point system. And so they will debit your account with points that allow you to do things, whether it be uh, to go to eat or to go entertain yourself or to buy things. And you have a whole point system. And when your points start uh, going down, you might not have points to go to an event that you wanted to go to. Sorry, your points aren't high enough to go to the mall. You said something on Facebook this week that we didn't like. So we, we took 50 of your, of your mall points away. You've got to build it back up again. Ultimately, what the Great Reset is, is giving up individual freedom and giving it to another power. So you don't have individual freedom anymore. So you don't have freedom to own anything. And you're happy with that because the other power, they care about you. Yeah. You don't have power to own your own business or to make a livelihood. And you can work for Walmart or you can work for a big corporation, maybe Amazon. Maybe Facebook, but you can't work for yourself, and you're going to be happy with that because Amazon's going to buy your little business, and they're going to own what you've worked to build. You're not going to have freedom to make a living. You're not going to have freedom to travel. Well, unless you do what they tell you to do. As long as you get the new vaccination ID card, which they're already putting out there right now. It's out there. They're really promoting it, saying, really, by the summer, we want to have a vaccination ID card that allows you to travel on any public transit. You won't have freedom to bear arms to defend yourself. You won't have freedom to buy and sell. You won't have freedom to assemble. You won't have freedom to worship. You won't have freedom of speech. And your freedom of speech is quickly eroding, just like Danny was saying how, you know, Doug Batcher put an amazing fax, a sermon about the papacy, and he was flagged. And they're flagging people left and right. If you go against their uh, desired new president, they're going to flag you. And they put a bunch of material that you've got to read to make sure that you know that the election's done. And it doesn't matter what the courts might do or not do. 
There's a system already in place and it's getting more strict every day saying you're going to follow the new order of things for the common good of mankind and if you don't want to be part of that plan, we will just eliminate you from social gatherings in today's social world. You'll be an isolated little person off in the corner by yourself. That is what the Great Reset is, the global elite deciding for all of us what's best for us. Now, I'm not just going to put it in the global elite's hands to say that they're responsible for all of this, or that the papies are responsible for all of it, or the Democrats, Republicans, because really the devil's responsible for this new Great Reset. That's right. The Bible says in Matthew 6, verse 10 to 12, that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities. So Satan's been working this out for some time, and he's just been working it out and devising these plans using leaders and individuals to work out for his purpose because he's about to come on the scene. He needs things set up so that he can uh, fulfill his agenda. The Great Reset. Ultimately, it boils down to... Who has control? Who has control? Do I have control or do I give my control to the government? Do I have control or do I give my control to God? Because ultimately, I don't want to be in control either. It boils down to who do I put my trust in to fix things? Who do you put your trust in to fix things? It's sad because even the Adventist church, it's, ama it's amazing to me how many Adventists that I run into that feel so overwhelmed that Trump did not win. Because Trump was the fix-it person. He was their savior. Now who's going to fix it and make America great again? I'm going to say this. Trump never was going to make America great again. Is Trump the great fix-it for you? If so, I feel bad for you. And to be honest, I was drawn in as part of that as well. And there's still even some times I'm thinking, when are they going to get this right? And it's not about the president, as per se, for me. It's about, was there fraud done in the election? And how can I trust the election process anymore? Why aren't we investigating this to make sure in the future we know what's going on? But can I trust God still? Does God know what, does God know what is going on? God does. And I may never know what fraud took place here in this side of eternity, but God knew, and God says, I'll be revealed in time, but you trust me that I'm still in charge. Right. We want to trust the right leaders to fix it. When it comes to the virus, there's so many doctors, and we're going, what does this doctor have to say about the corona? What does this doctor have to say? What does this doctor, what does this doctor say about the vaccination? We go from doctor to doctor to doctor to doctor all over the internet because doctors can fix everything. Yeah. And so we look to doctors to fix all the health problems. You know, people look to educators to fix the education system. I'll tell you what, some of the worst teachers I had in college were those who taught education. I hate to say it, but it's just how it was. The best educators teach in elementary schools. So if you don't learn how to teach, go to an elementary school and find a good teacher. The right scientists can fix our problems. Congress can fix it. Pastors can fix it. Money can fix it. The military can fix it. You want the vaccination to get out quickly? Give it to the military. They'll get it out there. Social media can fix it. Obama said, yes, we can. We can't fix it. Trump says, yes, I can. I can make America great. He cannot fix it. But I know of somebody who can fix it. Amen. And it's found in this book that a lot of people don't read, and the people who do read don't believe. If they did believe, they wouldn't be afraid or worried or concerned. Preaching. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. So I ask you today, whose shoulders is the government on? According to the Bible. And I would say the kingdoms of the world, the governments of the world are still on God's shoulders. Do I decide... Who's going to be the next ruler? No. Now it's interesting when I was in academy, and maybe some of our academy kids here, maybe it still works this way, but we had something called the student association, the student council, whatever you call it. And each year you get to pick new leaders. And you got to choose who was going to be in charge. 
How do young people vote on your leaders today? I, I think about back when I was in academy. The person who was the coolest, I'm going to vote for them. <laughs> oh, the person, oh, they're in choir, they sing really good. I'm going to vote for them. They'll be great leaders because they sing. <laughs> or look at that hair. They have such nice hair. I'm going to vote for them. <laughs> Had nothing to do with their plan. I'm going to say today, God has a plan. And today our vote is really on two plans. God has a reset, and men have a reset. And you go to school, and, and, and high school, you go to vote for leaders there too, and you have all these ways to say, I'm going to vote for them because they play basketball, and they're, they're really cute. And so you vote for them because they... The sad reality is, that's how adults work when it comes to the political world a lot today too. <laughs> We're going to vote for them because they have a funny commercial on, uh, on the internet, and I like their commercial, so I'm giving them my vote. It's ridiculous. I'm voting for you because you, you got up and you said something funny, you told a corny joke. Oh, they like the same bands I like. I'm voting for you. I love that band on the radio. I'm voting for you to be my leader. There used to be a time in America we actually voted for people based on their plans. <laughs> Today, plans don't matter. But that's the choice of the Great Reset. There are two plans. And don't just choose like, well, I like this one because they offered me all this stuff. Or because, you know, I just, I, I like the entertainment that they like. That's really what Satan wants. You like my entertainment, so vote for me. You like what I'm going to give you, vote for me. God has a different type of reset. We're going to talk about those two choices, because really you get to choose God's reset or Satan's reset. That is the choice for 2021. And God says here, the government is going to be on Jesus' shoulders. And then it says this, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. Is Jesus still a mighty God? Amen. Then I shouldn't be anxious or worried about anything for 2021. So you know what? I don't know what 2021 has coming, but I know that my God is more mighty than anything the world could bring. And I know the governments are on his shoulders, so I don't really care what Congress decides here between January and January 20, because God's still in control. Whether or not you believe it or not, the Bible says it, and I believe it. Whether it's Biden or whether it's Trump, God's in control. Amen. Whether it's neither one of them, I don't know. Maybe it'll be Harris. I don't know who it's going to be, but God's still in control, and he's more mighty than Biden and Harris and Trump and Pence and the papacy. And it says that he's the everlasting father, the prince of peace, of the increase of his government and peace. There will be no end. Do I believe this today? Ultimately, what the Great Reset is, do I trust myself to save myself, or man to save myself, or do I trust God to save myself? The Great Reset started a long, long time ago. You know, doesn't Solomon say there's nothing new under the sun? We're like, oh, there's something new, a Great Reset. No, and a reset's not a bad thing. In fact, the reset was already put into place before God even created the world. Because the Bible says in Revelation, the lamb was slain at the foundation of the world. And so before the foundation of the world, you're right, the lamb slain before the foundation of the world, before the world was even made, God already had the plan in place because he knew it was going to happen. He knew that sin would require a great reset. And he knew he was the only one who could fix the problem. Because once sin was in us, we couldn't fix it. Only God could. And so Eve messes up. She sins. Adam messes up. And they have a choice to make. Who's going to fix my problem? Who's going to reset me? God or me? <laughs> because Satan's whole lie is once you eat this, you'll be like God. So you're in control now and you can fix it. Up at that point, they trusted God to provide everything. This beautiful garden, the food. And now all of a sudden, it's like, God can't provide this. We've just messed up. We're naked. Well, they were naked when God first made them. But now they didn't have his glory. And they thought they could gain God's glory by grabbing some fig leaves. Well, this will fix it up. This will bring his glory back. And that, that was very shameful. That's what happens with our, our, our failures to try to reset ourselves. And so they tie these fig leaves together and think, the problem is fixed. When God comes, it's all good. He'll never know. And here they are in their fig leaves. And God says, why are you hiding? Why are you in these fig leaves? And they said, well, because we ate the fruit and we're, we're trying to fix this problem here. And the reset that man had did not work. It didn't reset anything, really. But God had already set the great reset into place before the foundation of the world. And he went and killed animals and he clothed them. So the reset is this. It's going to cost me everything. It was going to cost God everything. How can we reset anything when it's going to cost God himself everything? 
So God says, one day this is going to be, I'm going to shed my blood to fix this, and I'm going to clothe you with my righteousness. Right now it's just an animal you're clothed with. But this is just a foreshadow of what's to come. And so he sets up this whole system called the sanctuary system, starting with Adam and Eve, because we know Abel sacrificed a lamb and his brother murdered him because he was trying to do his own reset by sacrificing fruit. Thinking, you know what, I can fix this problem. I'll sacrifice fruits and veggies and that'll fix it. Only the lamb can fix it. And it wasn't the physical animal that was fixing the problem. It was a symbol. It was a foreshadow of things to come. How do I know that? Because in Psalm chapter 51, um, David tried to do a great reset by himself. David committed adultery and said, I can fix this. So he tried to get Uriah to go back and be with his wife, and that didn't fix the problem because Uriah wouldn't. And David says, well, I can fix this. I'll fix this sin by having Uriah killed. That just compounded the problem. He marries Bathsheba and thinks all is fixed. But David did not fix the problem. He thought everything was reset and the kingdom could go back to normal. And God said, no. You're a man after my own heart. And you can't fix it. Even those who are the remnant, we can't fix it. But Jesus has fixed it. And he can fix it. In Psalm 51, after being found out. Because God needs to uncover our sins. We try to cover. That's, that's another thing the Greek said does. It tries to cover everything up. You can call it the great cover-up. God's is the great uncovering. It says, okay, here's the transparency. Here's who you are. Do you want me to fix you or not? And after doing that with David, David says this, yes, that's who I am. Verse 10, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. I'm an adulterous murderer. I can't cover it up anymore. I can't fix it, but you can fix it. Amen. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me. Reset. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. David didn't have much joy during that time, I'm sure, until God uncovered his sins and forgave him. Restore, give me again the joy of your salvation. Uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you. In order to be able to lead sinners to Jesus, we ourselves have to be restored. We have to be forgiven. We have to confess our sins. The problem with the Great Reset is it's all based on men not giving up their sins. It's about men fixing the problem without changing their behavior and hearts. And I'll say this. Some people can try to change behavior, but that doesn't fix their problem either. I mean, the, the Great Reset wants to change all of the behavior. You're going to behave this certain way. But that doesn't change the heart condition. And that's why whatever we do to try to enforce behavioral rules, we can never reset mankind because only God can change our heart. The sacrificial system had become so perverted around this time and shortly after it got worse and worse until eventually God says, I don't want your sacrifices anymore. I don't want to see any more bloodshed of animals. I don't want to see your celebrations anymore. Isaiah 1, you can read it. They had become an abomination. God didn't care about sacrifices. David knew that because he says right here in verse 16, For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You see, David could have said, Oh, I went and killed a man and took his wife. I'll just kill sheep and the problem's fixed. That wouldn't have fixed the problem. But that's what it was becoming for Israel. He said, We can just fix the problem. It's about salvation by works. We can sin and just kill an animal and it's done. No one has to know about it. And so people just started sinning left and right. We can take advantage as long as we kill another animal. It's salvation by killing an animal. But we don't have to change. David says the sacrifices of burnt offerings you do not delight in. But verse 17, the sacrifices of God are what? A broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. Because God wants to reset our hearts. He wants to reset our spirits. And so the sacrificial system became so perverted that God says, I'm, I'm sending you off to Babylon. 
They didn't care about people anymore. They didn't care about each other. And it became really a, a system of salvation by works. And sadly, after coming back from Babylon, it was still salvation by works because when Jesus came, he went to cleanse the temple and said, man, you have made the sacrificial system a den of thieves. They were charging people for the sheep and for the sacrifices three to five to seven times more than they, even the value. And they come in and buy it and they were making a lot of money off the sacrificial system. Said, I can't wait till next year's Passover so we can clean your pockets again. And as long as you come and give us your money, you'll be forgiven. We'll give you the sheep that you need. And so it became salvation by paying the priest. Salvation by sacrificing an animal. But no cleansing of the heart. No transformation of the spirit. And so God sent Jesus, his son. They ripped the, God ripped the curtain from top to bottom and says, done. No more animals. Because Jesus was the Lamb of God. Jesus has cleansed you once for all. If you come to him and surrender to him and ask for his Holy Spirit. And not only will he cleanse your sins, but he'll give you a new heart and a new mind. The problem is most people don't want a new heart. They want a new mind. They want to be able to fix the problems by sacrificing something and then continuing on in their sin. The sad reality is today Israel wants to bring the sacrificial system back. It's in the news. They're, they're already in the process of rebuilding a temple and coming back and killing lambs. This is in Whitwell today. That's an abomination. You're right, it's an abomination. Why would we bring back sacrificing animals when Jesus was our atoning sacrifice? Because they've disregarded Jesus and they don't want to be like Jesus. <laughs> they would continue living like humanity and killing animals to fix the problem. But that was never the fix. But it wasn't just an issue that's going to come soon when they're trying to bring back the sacrificial system. It was happening throughout the Dark Ages. The Catholic Church said, okay, we don't have sacrifices of animals. We'll just make the little bread the sacrifice. And we'll say this little wafer is now the literal body of Jesus. And we'll dip it into this juice, which is a little bud of Jesus. And as long as you come to Mass each week and do the Eucharist, you can be saved. Salvation by works. Salvation by putting a wafer in my mouth. Okay. So I can go and lie to my parents. I can go and cheat on a test. And it does not matter. As long as I put the wafer on my tongue, I'm all good. Salvation by confessing to a priest. I can do whatever I want and say what I want. I can lie and cheat and be the person I want to be. I don't need Jesus because as long as I do my rosary, as long as I do so many Hail Marys, salvation by rosary, salvation by Hail Mary, salvation by Mass, salvation by sprinkling, because if a baby dies before they get sprinkled, I don't know. There was always a work involved, not Christ's work, but what were you going to do? Really, the only part we play is surrender. That's it. I surrender myself to Jesus. Other than that, I can't do anything. I had a friend this week who was talking about sanctification. Even that's the whole work of God. Yeah. God's the one who sanctifies. I don't have any work in that process. I go to him and say, Jesus, I surrender myself to you. Give me your Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit starts transforming from the inside and my behavior starts changing from the right motives. Not as, guess what I did? I've now overcome caffeine and so I don't drink soda. Look what I did. Salvation by me. I drink only water. And not just any water, it's Dasani. No, it's not salvation by what I do. But that's how the church kind of taught in the early years and it turned a lot of young people away because it, it turned into kind of a salvation. Guess what, I don't listen to that type of music and I don't go there and I don't do this and I don't eat this. All salvation by what I'm doing rather than what God's doing in me. So they're saying, you know what, I spent time with Jesus today and he gave me victory over something. Praise God. Praise God, the great reset. God wants to do in us. And so we have a choice. You know, what reset is it that we want? The Bible says in Revelation 13 that the papacy, which controlled the world during the Dark Ages, would receive a deadly wound. And they did in 1798. But they said that deadly wound would be healed, and it is today. And it's interesting because Pope Francis is one of the key leaders behind the Great Reset. He talks about it quite a bit. You can actually just go to the internet, type in Pope Francis and Great Reset. You can listen to the words from his own mouth. I'm not going to preach his words, but he talks about it at length at times, and he's written about it in his Laudato Si. Part of the Great Reset is not just about changing the environment, but it's about bringing in a new rest on Sunday where we shut everything down and come to worship so the environment is uh, 
refreshed by our resting. So when we rest on Sunday, the environment gets a great reset every single week, and that great reset will fix the environmental problems. It'll fix our problems and how we treat one another because we'll be having family time together and worshiping together. And of course, it has to be on the same day because how it will work if, you know, you have one group resting on this day and everyone else working, another group, we all have to do it at the same time for the common good of mankind. So sorry, Islam, you can't worship on Friday. Sorry, Jews and Adventists, you can't worship on Saturday. Sorry, but they're not sorry at all. Yes, we're all for the common good. We're worshiping together on Sunday. And it's in his own document. You can read it. So, Revelation 13 tells us that was going to happen. So don't, don't get worried when you say, oh, there's going to be a great reset. Hey, God knew it from the foundation of the world. He told us about it in Revelation 13. So I have a message to share with Catholic friends. And I do have some friends who are Catholic. I have relatives who are Catholic. I have a message to share with Protestant friends who haven't learned about the Sabbath yet. That are going to join together. But it's interesting because as I was doing this message on Christmas Day, the Pope was giving a Christmas Mass from the Vatican. It wasn't well attended because of COVID, but everyone was watching it on Zoom and on live. Like, there it was, and I had it on my phone too, and I was listening. And then I started reading some of the comments. And there'd be a comment that says, you need to read Revelation. This is actually Antichrist, what he's teaching. And this is an abomination as he was sharing certain things. And you know what? There are a lot of Catholics right now who are open because they don't believe in the current pope. That's right. They think, you know, this is a pope that backs abortion. This is a pope that backs gay marriage. This is a pope, he's gone as far left as you can go, and... Even Catholics that haven't accepted full truth yet are coming to reality that maybe I've got to start looking in the Bible. Because I know some of the decisions this guy is making just aren't right. Not even from, because you've got to understand uh, the Jesuit Pope, it's not just about winning Catholics over, he's got to win all the pagans over too. And to win all the pagans over, you've got to bring sin into the church just like they did in the early Catholic church with all the idols that they brought on in. With love. Yeah. And so there are Catholics waking up and they're saying, you know what? This isn't right. This isn't right. There's actually one website. It's called the Church Militant. I've been watching some of their videos recently. And they're like, you know what? This Pope is not following what the founders taught us. And I'm not saying what the founders all taught them was true and right. But there's, what do I want to say? There's a group of people in the Catholic Church that God's going to save. They're going to come out of her. God has, still has people in the Catholic Church that are going to come out of Babylon. They're going to be saved. Amen. Praise God. Amen. But who's going to take them the message when they have questions? Hopefully his remnant people will be ready and we'll have answers to give them and we won't be worrying about, oh man, when's COVID going to end? When can we go back to our restaurants? When can we go back to the, the sporting events and the movies and doing this and that? No, our jobs would be like, man, there are people right now so hungry for truth. And what the truth is, well, we're going through a great reset and you have two choices. God's reset, which we've talked about a little bit today, and the Pope's reset. But I want to tell you how the Pope's reset is going to end. Because ultimately, that's ultimately what I want to know. How does this, how is this going to end? And how is this going to end? How is this going to work out for me? How is this going to work out for me? I want to know the ending point. We read in Revelation 21 this morning for our scripture how God's in. He said, Behold, I will make all things new. I'm going to give you a new heaven, a new earth. There'll be no more sea. We won't be separated by oceans anymore. Just one big landmass where we're all together again. And there's not going to be any more dying, and any more pain, and any more sorrow. And God's going to be there dwelling with us. And we're going to be happy. Not because God owns everything and we own nothing, because God's going to give us property. <laughs> and it's going to be ours. And God's going to give us this to take care of. And we're going to have friendships and relationships with one another. It's a really good ending. When you read Revelation 21 and 22, like that's a great ending. Yeah. But for those who don't understand prophecy, whether they be Protestants that are apostate, or whether it be Catholics, or whether it be Muslim, or Hindus, or whatever they might believe, whether you're atheist, you're going to wake up this year to the Great Reset. And I want to tell you how it ends, just for the world's Great Reset. In Revelation chapter 17, the Bible says this. Revelation 17 and verse 12. 
says the ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have not received a kingdom as of yet. But they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. So the beast in prophecy we know it represents the papacy and I don't have time to go into that. But there are going to be rulers of this world that the papacy gives power to. And they are going to give power, their power, and authority to the papacy. Just like during the Middle Ages. The kings gave their authority to the papacy because they were afraid of getting excommunicated and losing out in eternal life because eternal life only came through the Pope. And it says ten horns are going to be given power. So ten kings are going to get this power. And it says in verse 13, These are in one mind and they will give their power and authority to the beast. So the rulers of the world are going to give their power and authority to the papacy. And it says, then they will make war with the Lamb. And so they're, they're not going to go along with God's great reset. They have their own reset plan. And it says, the Lamb will do what? Overcome them. Man, I want to be part of the team that's overcoming. I know that right now. I like to be part of the overcoming the winning side. So you know the winning team is going to be the Lamb. It tells you that right there. And it says that the Lamb is the Lord of lords, the King of kings, and those who are with Him are called chosen and faithful. Do you want to be called chosen and faithful? Then He said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits, that's the false papal church, all the churches that join her, she has harlot daughters. It says, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are the peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. Which goes along with Revelation 13, which says the whole world wanders after the beast. Because waters represents all the peoples. And so all the peoples of the earth have to make a decision. It doesn't matter where you live, whether you're in America or in China or, or whatever part of the world that you're living in, Russia. It doesn't matter. We all have to make a choice what reset we're going to be part of. Do we follow this new global reset being led by the papal system? Or do we follow, follow God's reset? We know the Lamb overcomes. In verse 16 it says, The ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot. So eventually the rulers of the kingdom of the earth get angry and start hating the church. Saying, you've deceived us. Your reset plan did not work. You said this would save the environment by creating a worship law. It didn't save the environment. Look at all the natural disasters that are happening right now. Look at what's happening to the people and the riots and the civil unrest. You said by having a Sunday law, it would, it would fix civil unrest. And so the global leaders get very frustrated. Yeah. And I challenge, man, Catholic bishops, read this. <laughs> know what's about to happen. Right. The Bible tells you you're in too. So the ten horns which you saw on the beast will hate the harlot and make her destitute and naked, eat her flesh and burn her with fire. So all of these political rulers that gave their power to the beast and were given power by the beast eventually turn on to this religious system and destroy it. For God put it in their hearts to fulfill his purpose to be one mind and to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman whom you saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the great earth. And then God has a message for us in Revelation 18. After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven having great authority and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried out mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. I'll give a little promo call out to Little Light Ministries. You have brought a lot of this evil out. I mean, it's all over the entertainment industry today. Some people say, the world can get a lot more wicked. I don't know how I can get much more wicked. All you've got to do is just see what the media is promoting all the time, constantly. It's pure evil. It says, For the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. If you're part of God's church and still living in Babylon, six days of the week. But you say, well, I go to church on Sabbath. It's all good. No, the Jews went to church on Sabbath and it wasn't all good. <laughs> Many of the Jewish leaders in Jesus' day were telling people, let's cry crucify Jesus and get him out of the picture. We don't want to do things according to his reset. We want to keep slaughtering lambs. And so just because you come to a pew on Sabbath doesn't give you a get into heaven free card. 
because I'm going to close with one final verse today, which the Great Reset is more than just coming and spending one hour with Jesus on the seventh day of the week. He says, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. It's not salvation by Sabbath keeping. Okay? We, we come to church on the Sabbath because we are saved, because Jesus has saved us. People who see Sabbath keeping as a work issue to get to heaven, they're going to have no problem going along with the Great Reset. Okay, well, Sabbath doesn't work. I'll just keep Sunday and I'll get to heaven that way. Ezekiel 36, 26, my final verse of the day. Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 26. This is the great reset that Jesus wants to do in our lives this new year. Not just today, on this first Sabbath of the new year, but tomorrow when you wake up. And the next day when you wake up. Right. And the next day. I'm starting in verse 35 actually. Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 25. Ezekiel 36 and verse 25. This is Ezekiel writing to the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The words of, of God. Ezekiel 36, 25. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. This is not talking about infant baptism, just in case you were wondering. It's talking about the early and latter rain. God wants to rain the Holy Spirit on you, so you can be clean. He says, I'm going to sprinkle this water on you and you're going to be clean. And then he goes on to say, I will cleanse you from your filthiness and from all your idols. You see, it's not just enough to say, look, Jesus died for my sins. I'm justified. I can live any way I want. Jesus died to cleanse us from our sins. And there are many today who think that Christ's sacrifice was nothing more than like the animals of old, saying, you know what, as long as I just tell Jesus, you know, forgive me, I can go back and keep just saying, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me, and keep crucifying him over and over and over. But Jesus says, I want to clean you from your filthiness. 1 John, was it 1-7 or 1-9? If you confess your sins, 1-9. If you confess your sins... He's faithful and just to forgive and people like to take out that and part. Wait a minute. I don't want to be clean. Just forgive me. I want to be justified but not sanctified. Just forgive me of my sins. I don't want you to you know, clean me. I don't want to have to give up my idols. And that's what it says here. It says, I'm going to cleanse you of your filthiness and I'm going to take away your idols. How many of your idols? A-L-L. Oh, what a beautiful promise. It's like, I'll sprinkle you, I'll give you my early and latter rain, and I'll take away all your idols, and I'll make you clean, if you want it. That's the great reset. And in verse 26, I'll give you a new heart, Amen. and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh, and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments, and you will do them. And it won't be out of obligation or a burden. It'll be a delight and a joy. Because we've been reset. Our minds and hearts have been transformed. They've been reprogrammed to have the character of Jesus. And then he says in verse 28, Then you shall dwell on the land that I gave to your fathers. You shall be my people, and I will be your God. That's a wonderful invitation for 2021. Amen. Yeah, the Pope's going to be pushing his great reset, but I've got a job as a remnant Adventist to po push Jesus' great reset and says, look at this, God has a great reset. And if you follow it, you'll never have to worry or be anxious or be fearful again. And you can come to Jesus every day and he will continue that sanctification reset process and he will clean you from the inside out. Our closing hymn today is 319, which is a song about God's great reset. Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart. I hope that's what you want for 2021. Not just to be a Christian by your behavior and your works, but to be a Christian because Jesus has transformed and changed your heart. Let's stand and sing our closing hymn together, 319.
prayer today that we will let you reset us because the great reset isn't just something that takes place on December 25 or January 1 but it takes place daily as we die to self and we ask for your Holy Spirit to come and transform us and renew our minds Father it's my prayer that today we will leave here reset that we will be Christians in our heart. That we will be more loving and we will love like Jesus from our heart. That we will be holy not in our own merits or our own works, but because it's Christ in us, the hope of glory working through our hearts. That we will be like Jesus, that we will be Christians from the inside out. And Father, I know we're going to be going separate ways here. Just a brief moment. It's my prayer tomorrow that when each of us wake up, we'll allow you to reset us again to be like Jesus. Amen. And the next day, and the next day, and the next day, until you come, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated, and the deacon will usher you out. Amen.